Hi, thank you for inviting me. Today I'm going to speak about the financial decisions of very high net worth individuals in the US. This is a joint process, uh, project with uh, two colleagues, uh, one from Harvard Business School, Luis Vicera, and another one from NYU, uh, Ingo Walter. So the question that we are asking in this series of projects is how do the top 0.1% of the population invest their money? What are, our, what are their financial positions, their transactions, and in particular, once we look at their uh, char the characteristics of their portfolios, how do their portfolio differ from the rest of the population in terms of liquidity, timing and amount of rebalancing activity, type of investment that they put in their portfolios, and more in general, the characteristics, li risk, liquidity, and tax status of their investments. And the reason why we care about this question is twofold. The first reason is that these people have a lot of wealth and either directly or indirectly as being client of financial institutions affect asset prices. Their preference, their needs, their decisions are the ones that ultimately get reflected in prices. And so understanding their behavior is going to help us in underst better understanding what changes asset prices. The second reason why we care about is because from the point of view of the average investor, what can we learn about our own investing from their investment strategy? Are there parts that we replicate? Are there things that are unique to these people? How do they lever their advantages? And are there cases in which they also mess up? We are going to look at the behavior of a sample of uh, very high net worth individuals. They have on average $90 million in their financial portfolios, and we follow them from 2000 through the boom till the financial crisis. And so we'll see how they're fair over there. So let's start by talking, why this, talking about why these people might be different. So one of the reasons is that they are less constrained than most, most of us. First, they have access to a wider set of financial opportunity and investments. They can invest in private equity, they can be angel investors, commodity, timber, you name it. A lot of other securities that the average investor doesn't have access to. They also are likely to face less financial constraints like liquidity type of constraints, but they have constraints of a different nature. It's likely that a big part of their wealth is illiquid, either because it's invested in a business of some type, and so this will, be, will have an effect on the way they invest the rest of their financial portfolios. They might have an interest in maintaining controls of certain entities. They might be worried about taxes. They might also be worried about the optimal way of passing wealth from one generation to the next. So it's not clear that uh, you should give your kids all their money once they turn 18 or 21 or in general, what is the best approach to take. And finally, they care a lot about tax efficiency. For them, it's an important consideration. They are more financially sophisticated they have higher education, and they also have a lot of advisors working for them. Family offices, registered investment advisors, um, private well managers, and so on. So how does this affect their investment? And once they affect their investment, what can we say in general about our theories? Do finance theories that you guys, I study in class, really reflect the reality and the constraints and issues that these people face? Or should we modify our theories to take into account some of the features that we, of the portfolios that we observe in reality? Okay, so let's look first at the, some of the investment mistakes that everybody makes, and let's see whether the wealthy behave differently, if yes, why, or what can we learn? So as Kent knows, as a behavioral economist, there are a lot of investment mistakes that maybe we all know from our experience. One is trading too much holding on to your losers instead of realizing tax losses, and selling too much of the winners. Uh, sometimes people have too conservative portfolios, right? They prefer not to lose money, but then they leave a lot of money on the table as a result. They can be under-diversified, invest in very few stocks that they think they have some information about, but this might be true or not. They can do little rebalancing, and also a lot of people <coughs> look at the return, but without subtracting the fees. So how much money are you leaving to your mutual funds? How much money are you leaving to your financial advisor? Is it still worth, after controlling for the risk, to use such financial advisors? And we will see that these people, on average, have eight financial advisors. 
So they spread their money across different people. They don't put all their eggs in one nest. And after the crisis and after all the scandals with Meadows, Madoff and others, they even increase the number of their financial advisors. So to diversify advisor risk in some sense. Okay, so investing is not simple. When we look at an investment, we need to take into account the investment horizon. We need to evaluate investment opportunities in terms of risk, in terms of returns. We have to decide our own tolerance for risk and illiquidities. And in general, in addition to our financial portfolios, we might have other issues like private businesses, real estate, uh, both commercial and our own housing, incentive compensations if we are executives, and also our human capital. What is the shape of our salary going over time, over our lifetime? Maybe, you know, we start low, we take an MBA, so we actually borrow money or invest in our MBAs, and then one day we'll become entrepreneurs, executives, or something, and so our income profile will go up very much. Should we take this into account in our portfolio and how? Finally, we might, have, we might have other interactions between saving and investment decision. We might want to do estate, tax, uh, estate and tax planning. And in general, there are a lot of investment products out there. They are quite complex. How do we evaluate? So these are all <coughs> the issues that people face. And there is a lot of research on 401k plans, some of which I'm also doing, and on uh, brokerage accounts that show that there are people tend to, do mis to make mistakes when investing. So it's difficult, though, to get an overview of what uh, an overall portfolio of an investor looks like. Every time you look at a 401k, you always have one snapshot of this person's financial activity, but you don't know whether this person maybe exhibits inertia in his 401k. Starts the 401k, takes one decision, never looks at it again. But on the other side, might be trading every day super fast in his brokerage account. So how can we con reconciliate these two things and do we observe them? So here we have an anonymous data set. So we know they are rich, we are not sure they are famous, but maybe some of them are. It's anonymous. So we follow them from 2000 to 2009, and we have very, very detailed information about their portfolio, the securities that they hold, the transactions, the taxes that they pay, the capital gain, the broker the transaction went through, the day in which they were transacting, and all these other characteristics, as well as the fees that they pay. And we follow them over time, trying to understand how they set up their portfolios. So before I go ahead and tell you a little more about the portfolio, let me tell you how a household looks like for us. So there is a super household, let's say the grandfather, and this super household has a lot of little houses inside them, their kids, with their own kids, and so on. In addition to this, this super household might have a company, might have a foundation, might have a family office on the side, and in general organizes the, its portfolio through trusts and different trust entities. Some of them are taxable, some of them are not, and these are going to influence the way they trade. So the question is, do these people make better investment decisions? Are, are they more willing to bear risk or are just similar to us? So this is how their wealth evolved over time. And you can see that during the boom of 2005 to 2007, their wealth increased quite a lot. You read in the newspaper that there is an increase in income inequality and wealth inequality in the US. And part of it is due to the fact that the top, in this case 0.1%, is taking a bigger and bigger fraction of, of the wealth thanks to their returns on their financial security. So how do the portfolio look like? Well, the portfolio looks, this is all the components of their portfolio. Let's just talk about the portfolio shares. It looks remarkably stable over time. So if there is something that we should learn from these people is that in general, we should diversify our portfolio. We shouldn't trade too much. We should rebalance every once in a while when there are changes in investment opportunity. But in general, we should not trade too much. The way they set up their portfolio is basically 30% fixed income, and we looked a little bit into it, 50% public equity, and then they put a 20% of their money on average in alternative investments. Hedge fund, private equity, or they do also a lot of angel investing. So they make direct investments in little companies. They usually do not diversify from what their expertise is. So if they are a biotech entrepreneur, they tend to invest in their biotech companies. 
You might think, well, if you are a biotech entrepreneur, you want to diversify it away, but that's not what they do. And they try to leverage their information advantage. They also rebalance quite carefully. So how their porf uh, share portfolio, like equity portfolio, looks like. Most of their equity portfolio is extremely well diversified as it's composed by individual stocks. So on average, these people have 120, 150 stocks. They don't buy a mutual funds, they buy the stocks themselves. One of possible reason why they tend to do this is just for tax reasons. So they can rebalance more flexibly and they can decide when to rebalance rather than uh, delegating this decision to the mutual fund manager. In addition to that, they have ETF and they have all sorts of other equity funds, but most of it is individual stocks. Uh, fixed income. The majority of fixed income, I'm not sure you can see, but the huge green part is munis. So most of these people invest in municipal bonds that are tax exempt. So again, their tax uh, implications are important for them. In addition to that, they invest in corporate bonds, foreign bonds, government bonds, and they also invest in mortgage-backed securities. So one thing that we found in this research is that while in general these people are really like very, not conservative, but very wise investors in the sense that they diversify and they rebalance, they also tend to follow investment facts, <coughs> fashions. So when mortgage-backed security were very fashionable, these people bought a lot of them. And then during the crisis, you see their wealth going down because they were not able to get out of it early enough. So this is probably one of the drawbacks of their investment strategies. Uh, do they rebalance? Yes, they tend to rebalance. Do they have superior returns compared to the rest of the market? Well, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So this is the blue part is our investors and the um, red part is the market as a whole. So in general, Sometimes they do better than the market, especially during the booms, but you can see that when the financial crisis comes, there is a big drop for everybody, including our investors. So the conclusion that we, have, we are drawing from this was that these people tend to rebalance in good times, but then when the bad times come, and then when it's very important to rebalance, they actually freeze, and this is what most of these people did. They froze during the crisis, they did nothing, and so their portfolio fell. Fixed income, similar stories. So what do they do during the crisis? They let their portfolio of equity fall. They don't sell, they don't rebalance, they just do nothing. Some of them put a huge amount of money into cash, but it's only very few of them. And you can see when you compare the average, which, uh, which is the uh, red line, with the median, that is the green line. So most people don't go into cash, but there are some very big investors that go into cash during the crisis, and actually slightly earlier than the crisis, in the second and the third <coughs> quarter of 2007, before the commercial paper freeze, before Bear Stern, before Lehman, a lot before Lehman. So these people seem to be very good at preserving their wealth during the crisis. The, the question is like, were they also able to go back in the market in March 2009 when there was the reverse? Uh, corporate bonds, how do they use their money while well, they either keep it in cash, they buy municipal securities or treasuries, like we would expect. Do they rebalance? Very little. Who is taking advantage of this market timing during the, uh, the crisis? So here what we did is we took the people, we ranked them based on their worth in the size. The bottom the size are people that are poor. They only have 10 million and they, they are in the style one. The top of the style are the super wealthy. So the style one and two, they're relatively poor. During the crisis freeze, and so the fluctuation in their portfolios, for example, in the equity, which is the purple part, is just due to basically the fact that the valuation of equity goes down over time. On the contrary, what the very wealthy do, as you see, they increase the blue part quite a lot. And the blue part is cash. So while in the past they had very little cash, once the crisis arrives, they put a lot more money into cash. And this is how they're preserving their wealth. So what are the next steps in our research? Well, we are gonna focus much more on the market timing. We, want to, we are collecting data on the events during the crisis and during the period that we observe to try to see if these people trade in advance of these events. If they do, which type of events they trade in advance to, how much money do they make, and do they have some sort of a, an advantage. If they have an advantage, 
Where does this advantage come from? From their social connection, their networks, uh, from their very good advisors, or not? So this is a topic for the next uh, for the next time. Thank you.